Hello, welcome to my keynote talk on asynchronous communication for power constraint event-based wireless sensing. And I really like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation and uh, to share our research results. Uh, thank you very much. So this work is joint work with my former PhD student, uh, Chen Yi, uh, who did most of the work on the channel coding part of the talk. Uh, it's also a collaboration with my colleague Wei Tang from New Mexico State University and his student Ki Song, who, is, uh, who are basically responsible more for the VLSI and hardware implementation part. So uh, to get started, we talk about asynchronous communication. Well, asynchronous communication. So if you look at this conversation between Dilbert and the boss, so the Boss uh, Dilbert asked the URL for the website, and the boss said I sent it to last week, and the boss didn't know actually where to send uh, the link. And then he said maybe he sent it to WhatsApp or Slack. And so this actually refers to asynchronous communication in the sense that we don't have a meeting, one by one meeting, where we have to talk synchronously in around Robin fashion, for example. So we communicate via Slack or WhatsApp or messages or email where we can actually respond to our leisure. So we can actually communicate asynchronously. So, and this is one of the themes uh, of this talk. And the other th theme is sensing. So right now, uh, we know for the Internet of Things, we have sensors everywhere, right? We have sensors in uh, like cars, in the body and in household devices. And uh, they are connected wirelessly to the Internet of Things and uh, talk to each other and make our lives really easy. That's at least a prediction, but um, in order to realize this, we need to rely on robust and reliable sensors. So sensors have to be, first of all, have uh, communication link should be robust, the sensor should be robust, and the sensor should also not fail. And like, for example, deplete the battery early. So this, uh, one, one special topic of the Internet of Things and sensing is ultra low power sensing. And we have a couple of applications um, where we can do that. So for example, this is like a water table monitoring station with a sensor which senses the water table. And of course, if there's a flooding, the sensor should put out an alert uh, that uh, a river has exceeded flux, flood stage or so on. Uh, we also can talk about a forest uh, fire sensing in a forest. And so we want to build in, we want to put in sensors in the forest and uh, they should actually alert if they detect fire. Uh, we can put sensors in the human body um, and for example, at joints to measure the strength and tendons or in the heart or in the brain. And in all these examples, the sensors have to be very low power so we cannot change the battery of the sensor every year or so. The sensors might be very inaccessible, like in the body or like in a forest. So the sensors have to run with the same battery uh, for a long time. So sensors typically have a small footprint uh, and uh, require only ultra low power uh, in general to operate. The So even they might be, we might think about they might be you know, powered by the environment, like by by movements uh, or by a solar power. So they might not even have a battery. But the problem is with these sensors, in order to detect these uh, in this application, to detect a critical event, the sensors often have to operate in always on mode, right, which depletes the battery. So one goal is for us to build sensors which are extreme power efficient and uh, can actually um, basically have it can be deployed and then basically forgotten because they are there and they're reliable and they work forever almost. So that's that's another goal. And essentially, if you look at look around, there's a huge market demand these days for sensing. 
So, for example, um, in this article, they predict that the global sensor market has reached like 90 billion uh, dollars, uh, like by 2027. So, like a market growth, like, you know, from 21 to 27 by 12.8%. So it's really a lot. So sensing is really a big topic. So it's a hot topic. And but there are still a lot of problems to solve, as we as we probably learned today in this talk. Uh, MIT News talks about the future of IoT is without batteries. So again, we need power efficient, low efficient, uh, low power sensors. And like there's an application here, which I found kind of interesting. We put really low power devices in, uh, like in, in fish, you know, and uh, they just put in, they are cheap and they can be just forgotten, but they have to be reliable. So there are actually tons of applications for this and a uh, lot of things to do also in terms of research and development. So we talk about um, asynchronous communication and therefore I find it in order to talk a bit about uh, the history of communications, of wireless communications in particular, or digital communication. So this is Claude Shannon, um, the father of the information age, and he as you probably know, he started his uh, famous uh, paper on, uh, on this theory in 1948. And uh, since then, he made, or in this paper, he made the prediction that there is, for each communication channel, there is a, a quantity we call capacity. And what he says is that we can build a code which can actually achieve the capacity of this channel uh, and this is actually the best code in the world we can build, so there is no better code. Unfortunately, what he predicted was theoretical, so we cannot, couldn't even implement uh, his codes he's predicting because the complexity is NP-hard, actually, particularly the decoding complexity. So, uh, and, but there have been a lot of progress over the years to approach uh, his predictions with uh, bounded complexity with practical codes. So the latest development are polar codes here in 2009, which we get very close to the Shannon capacity with bounded complexity. So all Shannon's theory is basically uh, dealing or basically dealt with synchronous communication. So communication where we actually have a clock and we send equidistant pulses over the communication channel. Whereas uh, in there's not much done in asynchronous event-driven communication. That's a new paradigm. Uh, and we want to explore this new paradigm actually in this talk. So this talk has two parts. The first part uh, is, let's say, more the practical part. It talks about asynchronous sampling and sensing and sensor design a bit. And this is work by, um, mostly driven by my collaborators, Wei and Kisong. The second part is our correction work on asynchronous communication. So we see we have to do a couple of new ideas. We have to put in a couple of new ideas to make this happen. And this work is basically driven by uh, my student Chen and myself. So uh, we first talk about part one, asynchronous sensing. So um, the if we talk about event-based sensing and we have seen a couple of applications like environmental observation uh, like forest fires for example disaster mitigation uh, it's related to environmental observation in a sense healthcare monitoring right you want to put sensors in the body and often what we observe are waveform signals and these waveform signals are typically sparse and the sparsity comes from the fact that the events are actually sparse and we see this here actually this is a heartbeat signal of a mouse we see these are these two these peaks are the heartbeats and so there are these heartbeats we want to detect maybe to detect the time we want to detect the uh the average uh heartbeat frequency of the mouse so we want to count uh, these heartbeats in a specific amount of time but there is also a lot of noise where nothing happens in between right in any practical sensor any synchronous sensor or synchronously operated sensor would also sample and transmit actually in the silent phase, right? Uh, but we only want to communicate events. So when you see actually for these sparse signals, um, event-based communication, asynchronous communication can give us a lot of advantages in terms of 
a power savings at the sensor. Again, our goal was to build ultra low power sensors. So how does asynchronous sampling work? So we take a signal and we compare the signal with reference voltages, so reference thresholds here with all these dash dotted lines. And whenever a signal has exceeded one of these thresholds, we place a pulse, right? Or we place a sample. You see this here? So if the signal changes quickly over time, we place a lot of samples. If nothing happens or the signal is pretty constant, we have less uh, samples. So this is basically the idea of asynchronous sampling. So uh, the information about the change of the signal is actually hidden in the timing of these pulses or these samples we take from the signal. So, uh, and, and as I mentioned already, so we see that uh, we get a significant gain in power and complexity actually in at the sensor. So for example, we don't need to put in a clock at the transmitter, right? To transmit the synchronous time intervals. And that provides a power reduction of over 80% for the transmitter circuit. And also we have shown that it depends on the signal, obviously, but in general, it's, um, we are about to reduce or we can reduce the number of transmitted bits. So we have a, for reference heartbeat signal, we have a 77.6% reduction observed in our previous work. So there are a lot of advantages. Also a re really new and emerging application is event-based vision connected with wireless communications. So, um, so typically what we have right now these days is looking at neuromorphic cameras, which have distinct features, which make them very suitable for self-driving vehicles, you know, because they're able to uh, detect pedestrians easier out of the background. And so these event-driven cameras work like retinas and the retina basically in the eye, uh, like sends out spikes, like which are these impulses, you know, the retina, you know, the nerve bundles from the retina sent to the brain. Uh, and then we have a spiking neural network, which works in a way that it doesn't really, um, doesn't really process like voltages or constant voltages, like in normal in regular um, uh, artificial neural network, it works with spikes. And also the reason is the hope is to implement bigger networks, which are actually more power efficient. So uh, once we do, once to train the network and we do inference, the network puts out some waveforms which are actually some spikes, right? So, and maybe give us some velocity of movements or give us some features of the scene uh, we're interested in. So in these, these features, as I said, they're waveform signals and they are sparse waveform signals mostly. So, um, and if you think about like what these guys propose here, the brain chip, uh, you know, they propose uh, AI, to put AI on the sensors. So, then this has to be transmitted, right? And what's the ideal way to transmit it? It's basically asynchronous communication, right? Because it's perfectly tailored uh, to the shape of the signal. So in the following, I'd like to give a brief literature overview. And this literature overview is by far not complete. And I apologize to everyone I've mentioned here. So asynchronous sampling has been proposed in several works. Uh, like we start off with asynchronous sigma delta modulation by Kicker et al. Then we have lever crossing sampling for A to D conversion by Sayina et al. And there's this nice overview survey paper by Chaparro. I think it was Signal Processing Magazine. And that actually gives an overview about, about all these kind of different um, asynchronous sampling schemes. Uh, there's also time encoding machine proposed um, not so far ago by Lazar and Toth. If we can talk about 2004 as not so far ago. And this time encoding machine in contrast to lever crossing, which is a lossy uh, compression scheme or sampling scheme, time encoding machine in theory is perfectly reconstructible. So it's not lossy, it's lossless in theory. And there also have been asynchronous communication schemes, wireless communication schemes for biomedical applications, like for example, Biomatic, uh, Sneeler and Hatzek and Gacido Akon and Surgeon recently, and also for remote sensing by Trakimas, Sonkasule and Mao and Zeng. Uh, so again, there might be a couple of more schemes I have overlooked here. I haven't 
stated, so I'm apologize for that. But in general, there is not too much out here, right? There's still this defeat is still wide open. And there are a lot of things to do. So how does asynchronous sampling go? So in, the in this talk, we basically deal with level crossing sampling and time encoding machines. So level crossing sampling, we have a waveform signal and we compare it with voltage levels here and these are these dashed red lines and whenever a signal exceeds a voltage level and the signal has a positive slope we send a plus one pulse and whenever the signal has a negative slope and again exceeds or touches one of these voltage levels then we send negative one and the corresponding pulse so we get a sequence of plus one and minus one pulses and the density of these pulses tell us basically um, the slope of the signal. So this is again kind of event-based communication because uh, if, we can, if we define, you know, it, you know basically uh, exceeding specific thresholds as an event, then, then we get exactly that if we have a lot of events in a short amount of time, then of course, you know, we have a denser pattern here. Otherwise, there's nothing much going on. Right, so in this case, our transmitter can be totally silent, right? It's nothing to transmit. The reconstruction is typically done uh, by forming a staircase signals from these plus ones, minus ones, and doing a, a low pass filtering. That's a lossy reconstruction. So, time encoding machine by Lazar is basically, um, is basically uh, given by this circuit. So uh, we, sorry, we take a signal and invert it or integrate it, and then basically send the output to a Schmidt trigger. And uh, the Schmidt trigger sends out positive phi and negative phi. And this is actually fed back to the input subtracted and integrated again. So the output or the outcome is, uh, like a waveform, like a rectangular waveform signal, where the times t0 and t1, t3 and t, I mean t2, t3, and so on indicate uh, the time where the Schmidt trigger actually flips between plus phi and negative phi. So uh, this kind of the staircase, this kind of waveform or rectangular waveform signal with different width, and the reconstruction is basically. So if you look at this signal, we can see that uh, the time between T1 and T0 uh, or between adjacent times is an estimate for the integral of the signal or for the, the value of the integral of the signal in this specific time instant. So and, and we can use this fact to reconstruct. So reconstruction actually is perfect in general, but uh, in practice it's, it's imperfect, but the error can be made very small here by increasing the complexity of the scheme. So, okay, so how to communicate now event-based sensor signals? So now suppose we have the sampling and now we want to communicate. So in, so what we propose is a scheme based on FSK. So we have our asynchronous sampling here and then we use FSK pulse forming modulation and so we send, uh, say this is like level crossing sampling, you have plus one and minus one pulses. So we send, you have two different FSK frequencies. We use on-off keying FSK because it's low complexity and power efficient. And then actually we send it through the AWGN channel. We have a match filter receiver where we filter out the corresponding frequency, uh, like for plus one or negative one. And then uh, we have a threshold detector with a threshold gamma and then we reconstruct the waveform. Uh, we have the sample estimates here, or the the pulse estimate, the, you know, the the peak, the pulse estimates, and then we reconstruct uh, the waveform here, getting S hat T. So uh, the goal is actually to minimize Euclidean distance between S T and S hat by for designing this whole system. And typically, we can show that the average sampling rate is smaller than the Nyquist rate if ST is sufficiently sparse, right? So, uh, so basically, I'd like to present, we have 
made a hardware implementation out of this. So I'd like to talk a, briefly talk about a bit about the hardware uh, implementation. So, so we use level crossing sampling, as we said, and for level crossing sampling, we have a circuit, a, co a comparator, comparator circuit where we have voltages and uh, compare basically the input signal with these corresponding voltages. So a bank of voltage com comparators, which I haven't shown here. But this is actually our FSK OK transmitter. It's actually very simple and it's why it's very power efficient. So this is the input actually um, from the uh, lever crossing sampling. So and if the input, uh, if it's logic zero, then nothing happens here. So there is no output. If the input is logic one, then this ring oscillator kicks in. And this ring oscillator basically is, uh, we have a carrier selector input here. So we are able to select uh, 16 carriers uh, from this ring oscillator. And the frequency of this ring oscillator is determined by the interplay of these connections X0 and X1. So depending on um, uh, what kind of um, output happens here? One of these multiplexers are engaged or they're not engaged. So they, they rather take, if this is like one, then they take X1. If this is zero, they take X0. So, and you see that the X1 circuit is, we have these inverters. They don't do anything, but they delay the signal. So, uh, whereas the branch here for the X0 is not delayed. So basically we have, by changing these multiplexers, we can incur different delays of this line. And so in this ring oscillator gives us different frequencies. So we have a power amplifier and this goes to the antenna. So the power amplifier consists of a subsequent sequence of inverters, which are bigger than the previous one. And so in, we can actually um, transmit the signal. So the receiver and um, the receiver basically, so typically now it's sensing applications, the transmitter or the sensor only contains the transmitter, not necessarily the receiver. Uh, what our assumption is essentially that our base station or sensor is sent to the base station, the base station is wall powered, but we can also think about low complexity um, FSK or like asynchronous communication receivers, which we have implemented here. So just briefly, we have the antenna, we have a match filter here, then we have an LNA, which filters out, which basically amplifies the output of the filter. And then we have a gain stage and level shifter. So level shifter is basically responsible for shifting the level, the detected uh, peaks shifting it up. We have an envelope detector here and uh, which, um, we can think about kind of a threshold detector. Um, and then we have a compar comparator and the output is like this. So very simple. So we have a demo, hardware demo. Uh, it's actually a couple of years old. So we're using a, an old process like an IBM 0.18 micrometer CMOS process. Uh, and the data are frequency design frequency range between 200 megahertz and two gigahertz. And data rate roughly what we could get like in our lab environments 2.3 megabits per second peak power consumption is a milliwatt milliwatts regime again this is we can bring this down significantly by switching to a much modern technology so i think that's if we go up to a like a factor 100 small technology and there are like these um or factor 10 small technology um you know, there are like this 80 nanometer technology or so, uh, then we can reduce the power consumption uh, significantly also. So this is basically credited to our old technology we're using. Anyway, here are some photos of the transmitter and receiver. So these chips here, these are this is the um, lever crossing chip and this is the tr transmitter chip. And uh, these are these are it's like two receiver chips on one board, actually, it's one receiver chip. So, so we actually um, fabricated these chips, these prototypes, and uh, and uh, so, of course, um, these receivers are quite big, but you could make the layout smaller, but this is just a demonstrator. So here you see this in action. So this is actually, these are, this is the uh, um, transmitter output. Um, so we, 
or you know what we what we this is actually what we sent. Uh, so this is we have these rectangular pulses for plus one and negative one. So and uh, this is what we receive at the transmitter at the receiver. So this is a decoded pulse for plus one, and this is for negative one. You see a bit of crosstalk here uh, because our if we transmit it around two gigahertz, our frequencies for plus one and negative one are fairly close apart. So uh, there is some crosstalk here, but in general, it works pretty well. So, so now we talk about part two and talk about error correction asynchronous communication. So basically, this is how to improve the performance of the preview scheme uh, of of our demonstrator of hardware setup or simple communication solution significantly while maintaining low complexity. So. Uh, what what um so so if we look at asynchronous communication um we uh have so, so basically the idea was we have a match filter at the receiver at the channel output and uh, and now if the channel is noiseless there's no noise then we de can detect exactly the pulses here right so our threshold gamma actually is uh is basically so um, basically determines uh, you know when this signal exceeds the threshold we can determine the position of the pulse and uh, now if there's noise we have two effects so one effect is that um, we cannot detect the pulse anymore because there's noise the threshold is too high so we have a deleted pulse or alternatively there is noise and we get an inserted pulse. So there is no pulse actually transmitted here, but we get an assertion because of the noise. So, and we see that a deletion can be very critical because we know that for level crossing, also for time encoding, the information is, is in the time, right? The transmit time. And if the transmit time is missing, then the whole signal, we get a lot of error propagation. So the whole signal waveform is messed up. Same for an assertion. So essentially, we have to deal with deletion and insertion errors in this channel. So this is the insertion deletion error performance without any error correcting code. So um, these are analytical curves, so we can compute them uh, for a Gaussian channel. And uh, the solid curves are for the deletion probability, the dash curves for the insertion probability as a function of the threshold. And we see that uh, this helps us select the right threshold. So for the insertion, the larger we make the threshold, the smaller the insertion probability, and it's the other way around for the deletions. And we would pick a threshold, like we have a certain design operating range on the channel, the CS over NUT, and we would pick that one where there's a crossover, right? So for example, for 5 dB, we would pick uh, something here of a uh, threshold of, um, yeah, so we would, I mean, here we would pick, a, so would pick a threshold here, which is like 0 0.6, right? So it would give us the same error, roughly, uh, for both cases, so. Okay, so now let's talk about um, some relevant error correcting schemes for deletion insertion errors in literature. So, there has been a lot of work done on deletion insertion errors in literature, basically um, with the background of file synchronization. We want to synchronize a file and one file has missing, it's missing a block. So you can think about a deletion and so you can figure out the deletion and only uh, copy or synchronize that part of the file which is missing. Uh, or you think about one application is also like in storage in racetrack memory, for example, where you basically have uh, cells which are failing and which you cannot detect, so you have a deletion. So, so there have been there are a lot of cases for this setting in the synchronous case, and it started off with the work by Vasham of and Um and uh, then there is more work actually, and uh, finally, I mean, what we are actually using in our work is the insertion of markers 
uh, to maintain synchronization. So this work basically insert markers and these markers basically tell us we know how the markers look like and if the markers don't match, we can detect actually an insertion or no deletion. So this is uh, some of the uh, ideas we are leveraging also for our work. But in general, if you look at error correction, there's no results for the asynchronous case, completely open. So and we try to fill this void with our work. So but the question first, we have to solve a couple of technical problems here. So first, the question is how to add redundancy. So um, and we actually need to preserve the pulse timing. So this is our pulse timing here from our level crossing. And we cannot just so typically in error correction, what you do is you add parity symbols to the information symbol, right? You have a block of messages or bits, and then you add some parity information, some extra information, and then you can detect or correct errors. So there is no place here to insert extra pulses, extra redundant pulses, right? Because these pulses, the times basically indicate the waveform. We cannot just place another pulse in there because we would mess up everything. So this doesn't work. So our idea is to instead extend the modulation alphabet. So we keep the event times, right? So this is the information layer. These are our plus minus one symbols from like, for example, the level crossing. And these are the corresponding events. Uh, and again, these times are asynchronous. And what we do is actually we add redundant layers here in the mod modulation alphabet. So we go from two FSK to four or eight FSK or even higher, right? And this is one MRA FSK symbols now, and the blue layers are these redundant layers. now. So this is one idea. There are a couple of more ideas, actually. Uh, we employ a concatenated error correction scheme. So we have two codes. Uh, we have first a marker code, which can detect deletions and insertions by putting using good uh, binary sequences uh, for that purpose. And for example, binary De Bruyne sequences. Uh, and uh, our outer code is a systematic code. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second why we need a systematic code. A uh, systematic code is a code actually where the information bits are present in the code were just copied. And we just add redundant information, just append redundant information. So the information word shows up in clear on the code word. And we use other convolutional codes. The reason is because one have a streaming behavior and the convolutional code has a very nice advantage. We need very small amount of memory on the chip. So our buffer memory is small and memory is actually expensive to implement on a sensor chip. And so the inner codes detect deletions and insertions. And uh, for example, if you have a deletion, we replace it with uh, like a random bit and this random bit, we don't know how it looks like, but this is actually fixed by the outer code. So the outer code is a cleanup code and basically corrects the substitution errors we make in fixing deletions. Insertions we can take off right away. Once we find an insertion, we can just remove it. And then we assemble the FSK symbol transmitted the event time. And we decode uh, via concatenated processing uh, so first we decode the inner code and the outer code, but we can also iterate between those. So this is just a block diagram of our FSK sensor transmission and receiving scheme. Uh, the red parts are given by the channel coding part. So this here is the transmitter on top, right? And this on the bottom is the receiver. So, uh, and we can see here we add the parity symbols um, and concatenate them with the information symbols and then add the marker symbol and then form the FSK pulse. So I'll explain how this goes in a second because we have to be careful with this one here, with this pulse forming. And then here we have depicted iterative decoder. Essentially, this is not really necessary. It's just okay to transmit, to first decode the, outer, the inner code and then the outer code we get a slight gain by doing soft decoding. So decoding reliabilities for the transmitted symbols and then feeding them back like in an iterative fashion. And for this, it can be shown that it's useful to permute the parity bits. So we permute the parity bits with this interleaver, but this is optional, right? We don't have to do this if we don't use iterative decoding here. As you see in the simulation results later, it gives us a slight 
increase in performance. We can also, again, we can also do sequential decoding. So I was talking about assembling the FSK symbols. So, and, and now, and also over the fact we use a systematic code. So why, why is that? So first of all, this is the information layer. These are the symbols coming from our level crossing sampling. Right, and each of these vertical, in the vertical, we have a modulation symbol, an FSK modulation symbol. And uh, so what we do is basically, we take, we take a block of K symbols, and for these K symbols, so K, K event times, basically. So each of these vertically is an event time, and we compute parity symbols. Right, so, and these parity symbols, and the K is very small, it's like four or even two, uh, and we compute parity symbols and these parity symbols are transmitted in the next block, right? And this is because we want to do instantaneous decoding. So the, the sensor sees information and computes the parity symbols and the information is stored like for one period of K event times and then used in the next block of K event times. So basically this is just this ensures instantaneous transmission and it shows also causality actually of the uh, sensor encoding circuit. So this changing and also yeah, it keeps it keeps the information layer and it keeps the symbol timings untouched. We cannot change information layer here, right? And we cannot change the symbol timings because they contain signal information. So this is chaining construction. It's a new uh, new ingredient we need actually to. Uh, we need actually to to make uh, this feasible for asynchronous communication and also to keep the footprint of the transmit sensor and the power consumption very small. So we have uh, like the code rate and the marker rate. Okay, also I forgot to say we transmit markers here in, in these layers of the FSK modulation alphabet. So we have both markers and parity symbols. So the code marker code rate and the channel code rate, the product has to be one over log to M. So the number of bits here for FSK symbols. So this, is, this relation is, is fixed and we can now play around with our C or M. We can trade off our C or M. We can make our C bigger, or M smaller and see what works best. So let me, for, let me also um, explain um, a bit uh, about making the sensor even more or even less complex. So, so this transmitter complexity, again, our goal is mostly reducing the transmitter complexity, can be actually re reduced by using residual source redundancy instead of using an explicit outer channel code. So this is actually, so we can actually get rid of this. So, and then the transmitter becomes very, very low complexity because we only have to add the marker symbols. So this is basically uh, driven by the observation that our sample sequence after level crossing, right? So we have continuous runs of the form 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. So this would be actually the pulses um, which, which are negative, right? Which are... So, um, and uh, we can model this by this macro chain. And, and this runs actually show up because we have a correlated, we have a waveform signal, right? Our signal, our data signal is, is correlated. And uh, even if we remove them with the correlation by doing asynchronous sampling, uh, there's still some correlation, some residual redundancy left over. So we model this behavior by this following four state macro chain, where our states are one, zero, 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 one, and one, one. And uh, so, and these, Alphas and betas are the probability where we stay in the same state, uh, either in a zero zero state or one one state. And you see that for a typical waveform signal, these probabilities are quite high, right? So we stay with high probability in these states. And uh, what we can now do is, um, okay, we all see the entropy is very small. We can use a forward backward algorithm on a four state trellis to decode this information, right? This actually happens in the decoder we can also use this iteratively because that's actually also a soft output decoder. But in general, um, um, it's just enough to do one shot without iteration 
but uh, this actually again this reduces transmit complexity significantly. So how to decode the marker code? So um, for the marker code, we graphically represent the time evolution and the effect of the insertion deletion channel and use that as a kind of trellis where we actually decode, use a run and forward backward algorithm on. So how does this go? So here is our transmit symbol. And these are the events. These are the like 0, 1, 2, up to T. These are our transmitted events basically, and these are received events, right? So one to R. And if you have a transition here in this grid from like in this case from one, one to two, two, just a single event has been transmitted and perfectly received, right? So the event time is increased in the input and the and is also increased at the output of the channel, right? If we have this scenario that we increase the event time from here from like uh, one two to two two right so we have this behavior then what happens is basically uh, that a deletion has happened so the event one has been deleted right so the event one has been deleted uh, because um, the input time is increased by one, whereas the output time is not increased, right? Whereas this diagonal here, like this is a delete, this is an insertion because here the input time is increased by one, but the output time is increased by two, right? So, and so this symbol one has been inserted actually. So, so we get basically a mismatch between event time if there are deletion insertions at the transmitter and the receiver, and we look at all these different, we look at paths on this trellis, optimal paths, path, actually, which would indicate the most likely sequence of insertion and deletions, which would have happened in our case. So, and we can do this by a forward backward algorithm. So this, uh, basically this um, probability is the one we're using. Here, so it's the probability that uh, received sequence has been, or sequence Y has been received given that uh, this uh, specific symbol, either plus one or negative one. And we have three terms in this probability deletion term, transmission insertion term. So, and, and we can compute soft values actually, we can pass to the outer channel decoder for the next decoder duration or use directly to estimate this symbol here. So, uh, and this can be also used to localize um, deleted inserted symbols. So um, we have this path here. So we have this diagonal line. The, in this case, this is the path where no deletion insertion have happened. And now suppose we obtain this path, uh, we see a deletion has happened here and here for this path insertion has happened here. Right, so we basically can obtain the maximum likelihood path by this observation here, by this expression. And this probability is a byproduct here. Take the argmax over, it's a byproduct of the FBA. So this can be used to find the optimal path and localize deleted inserted symbols. So let me just quickly um, talk about error correction for time encoding. So for time encoding, uh, all the information is a time signal. So we just need to protect uh, the times with markers. So there is no information actually in the amplitude of the signal, whether it's positive or negative. So, and, uh, so instead of using an outer code, we quantize the times, we quantize the relative time. So we quantize the placement of the middle symbol at time or the middle event at time t1 based on the neighboring event times. And for example, for eight FSK, we have two bits for the marker symbol, or we have one bit for the marker symbol and two bits for the quantization. So it's a very coarse quantization actually. So let me just look at numerical simulations because I'm getting slowly running of time here. So our source waveform signal is 100 milliseconds of a mouse heartbeat signal. Nyquist sampling rate is 15 kilohertz and an average sampling rate for level crossing we observe to be smaller as like 
roughly 10 kilohertz. So these are the channel codes we're using. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, but we can design these convolutional codes, marker codes and convolutional codes with different scenarios. And uh, these codes are designed to optimize basically at the performance of the individual schemes actually. So here are the simulation results. So this is a result where we don't use a reconstruction. So basically we look at uh, the sequence of pulses after level crossing sampling and before reconstruction and define an error probability based on the probability that these symbols are perfectly reconstructed or not versus the channel SNR. So and we see here, here we have the error probability, here we have the channel SNR, the dashed, the dotted line is the uncoded case for 2FSK and we see the results for different schemes for 4FSK and 8FSK. There are many curves here. Let me just highlight a couple of, of um, takeaways. So the purple dashed line is a source coding case where we have this very low complexity transmitter and we use source redundancy and we see already a significant gain compared to the uncoded case by just increasing the complexity of the transmitter moderately, very moderately. Once we use a channel code for the outer code, we get even better results here for the 4FSK. So we have different channel codes here. And this is just uh, the gain we get um, by using iterative processing. So uh, we get, so this is the gain from here to here by in including a permuter and interleaver for a block of 20 symbols. So that would of course incur a delay. So if you don't want a delay, this is something we can't do. But if you can tolerate a delay of 20 event, I think this is 20 event times, then uh, this we get a significant gain. And this is another gain, we get slight gain gate by doing more decode iterations. And similar observation for the ADFSK, the, uh, the red curve is the one we get if we don't have any event times, uh, if you, if, so if you don't have any interleaving here, if you add an interleaving, we get a better gain. And if we add iterative processing, we get uh, even more gain, right? But these two curves here are only related to, um, are basically related to, uh, to if, we, if we're allowed to have a delay latency, transmit latency of 20 event times, right? Which we might not have in many cases. So this is the result for real reconstruction. So here we look at the distortion, the end-to-end -end distortion, and we see the similar behavior. We have eight of SK curves here, four of SK curves here, and we see again the uncoded curve. There's a big gain towards compared to the uncoded curve. And again, uh, what we have here is uh, even like using a simple encoder just based on marker redundancy, we get actually a significant gain already compared to the uncoded case in reconstruction SNR. So here it's a comparison between time encoding and level crossing sampling. So what we have presented before was just time was level crossing sampling. So the solid curves are copied from the previous slides, uh, like for the distortion curves. And then we have the corresponding time encoding curves here. So uh, this is a dash time encoding, this dash curve here purple dash curve is the uncoded and by using a uh, 2FSK and a forward backward algorithm for detection and with the marker bit we actually get some gain here already and we get even more gain if you switch to 8FSK. Then these are the solid red curve is the curve we would have to compare to the dashed purple curve for the uh, for the time encoding. So this is a level crossing uncoded and we see that there's level crossing gives us a big advantage in general for uh, lower SNR for noisier channels. The channel gets better actually. We see that level crossing has a kind of, uh, it's a lossy compression scheme. So we have some residual distortion which is lower for time encoding. The same actually for the ADFSK case where we have to compare the black solid curve with the blue dash curve. All right, this actually ends my presentation. So a takeaway is asynchronous communication is really an emerging field uh, for event-based communication, particularly now 
uh, in light of neuromorphic processing, neuromorphic cameras. So this is really like a very, very hot topic, an emerging topic. We have presented a hardware demonstrator to show that we can transform our concepts actually into practice. And in order to combat the effect of noise and error correcting coding, we have to do a couple of novel contributions which are not present in error correction schemes for synchronous communications, which are listed here. And in general, uh, yes, we can do error correction for asynchronous communication uh, a little bit different, but we can do it with similar performance gains. And this is uh, the list of uh, papers which are the basis for these slides and uh, thank you very much for your time.